first of all uh, thanks very much for joining uh, this conversation on towards a post covid india my name is orgo sengupta and i'm the research director at vidhi i was just uh, looking at what happened after the spanish flu in 1980 and, and there's some very interesting books and interesting facts and one that particularly struck me was that before the spanish flu it was common place for governments to blame individuals for contracting infectious diseases it was only because 50 million people were affected by the spanish flu that this excuse was no longer justified and as a, in the aftermath of the spanish flu the three key things happened one governments realized that public health is a fundamental state concern two they set up health ministries uh, across many countries health ministries were set up for the first time after the spanish flu uh, and three epidemiology was funded in a more significant way so we find that in the united states for example there was a national morbidity reporting program and the ussr had set up a centralized public health care system so what are we going to do after the coronavirus pandemic in 2020 in 1918 after the spanish flu reforms passed us by because of colonial rule but in 2020 are reforms going to pass us by again or are we going to do something about it to seize the day uh, at vidhi we strongly argue for the latter and we've come out with uh, this briefing book you would have got a hard copy of it uh, where we've argued for 25 legal reforms that we think the country needs for discussion and deliberation among stakeholders and we've covered a wide range of issues from empowering the third tier to uh, the gig economy to ensuring that there is a pandemic preparedness law that india needs and speaking on these reforms the chief justice of india who's written a foreword for the book has said that and i quote it is the spirit of collective reform that i find pervades through this book there is little doubt about the fact that the coronavirus pandemic has forced everyone to look inwards into the changes that are needed to restore renew and reinvigorate ourselves it's no different for law and governance institutions in india unquote to discuss what those urgent law and governance reforms can be we have a stellar panel today dr indu bhushan is ceo of national health authority and ayushman bharat uh, Dr. K.P. Krishnan is a trained economist and many of you may know this but some of you may not also a trained lawyer and he retired most recently as the Secretary of Skill Development, Government of India. Lalitesh Katragada is the founder of Indihood and an internet evangelist in India. And Rohini Nilakani who can't join us in person but is because she's trapped in the beautiful forests of Kavini will be joining us remotely in a meta way uh, given we are all remote, uh, with uh, a, her pre-recorded message for us, together with some questions which she wanted to answer. Now, some housekeeping. We have uh, four to five minutes for opening remarks for each panelist, so that we have maximum time for discussion. Uh, and uh, when we are open for Q&A, we finish sharp at 6.30, so we encourage the audience uh, to post your questions as in, on, in, in the chat box and we'll try and take as many as possible both from YouTube, Facebook as well as from Zoom. This is the first in a series of conversations that we are doing on the briefing book. This is being brought to you in partnership with the print which has been cutting the clutter on digital news for the last many years and this is a series of conversations. Uh, please do follow Vidhi or the print's pages for the next few conversations which will take place next week. So having said that, I'll turn it over to our panelists. I'll start with you, Dr. Bhushan, first. Your opening remarks of one or two urgent reforms that are needed in mm -hmm. public health in India. Uh, thank you, Argyo. So I'd actually thought of uh, five reforms, but I'll uh, maybe I'll just uh, uh, focus on three. Uh, you know, uh, I've not read uh, books on uh, Spanish flu, but I had, uh, I've gone through the process of looking at SARS epidemic and I used to work uh -huh. at the Development Bank at that time and uh, I was responsible for uh, ADB's response to SARS. So what happened in the SARS is that the countries who were affected by SARS, they revamped the system entirely. Before SARS, we were following up the, with the countries for uh, providing projects, but uh, 
uh, they wouldn't take pro health projects because they thought that uh, they should not borrow for health. And after SARS, actually, they were following us that uh, uh, if we can provide uh, support for uh, support for health sector. So they increased their budget, they strengthened their preventive health system, they uh, created more lab networks, and the whole host of things happened. And you can see the result right now that Vietnam has had very small number of deaths so far. Uh, num the number of uh, infections in these countries have been minimum. So what India, coming back to India, I see three problems here. One, we don't spend enough. Uh, our spending on the health sector is inadequate. Number two, our spending on health is inequitable. Number three, our spending on health is inefficient. Inadequate, inequitable, and inefficient. In inadequate, uh, we spend only 1.2% of GDP on health, which is the lowest among all mid uh, middle income countries, lowest among all G20 countries, and out of 192 countries for which we have data, we are no one number, number 181. So one of the lowest in the world. Uh, so of course we need to increase this funding uh, because the 1.2% of GDP will not take us anywhere. Uh, our uh, expenditure is also inequitable, both at macro level, uh, also at the micro level. At macro level, if you look at our states, some states are like East Asian uh, countries and doing very well, and some states are like Sub-Saharan Africa. And in terms of spending, if you look at uh, the difference between what Kerala is spending or Karnataka is spending as compared to Bihar per capita, there's a difference of six or seven times. At the micro level, again, the same thing happens. Same thing is visible within states. And we see that uh, uh, the uh, richest 40% people, their hospitalization rate is almost double of the poorest 40% people. So, so there is a problem of inequity. And that inequity is actually ingrained. Even with the PMJ, Ashman uh, Bharat, we are seeing that uptake of this scheme has been actually much greater in those states which are actually doing much better already as compared to uh, UP and Bihar where we've not been able to uh, get it going. So in terms of money that we're providing, uh, we are still providing lower amount of money in per capita in UP Bihar as compared to the southern state. So we've not been able to redress that problem. At the same time, uh, we see that about uh, 6 million people fall into poverty because of uh, uh, health. Uh, out of pocket expenditure is about 60, more than 60% of expenditure, which is both inefficient and inequitable, and that needs to be redressed. And third thing is uh, lack of efficiency because 70% of uh, services are provided by the private sector, which is totally unregulated. The price, not only prices, but also in terms of quality. And so that uh, need to change. So we need to spend more. We need to ch spend uh, more equitably, uh, find ways in terms of uh, 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 encouraging investments in uh, uh, in uh, backward or I should say call it aspirational districts or in uh, underserved areas, uh, and it has to be more than uh, schemes like PMJ because we need to have we need to have uh, there is a vicious circle here, and we need to uh, break that vicious circle by uh, injecting some capital in uh, some of the aspirational uh, districts, and of course. Uh, much more regulations of the private sector, uh, much better or effective regulations of the private sector and providing support to the private sector in addition to providing them financing. Just two things I'll just, uh, in one sentence, one is on digital health. We need to do go much farther on digital health and there are issues related to uh, electronic medical records, telemedicine, use of AI and ML for uh, investigation and also use of data for, uh, for uh, policy making. And finally, uh, we should be bringing health as a concurrent subject uh, because uh, this epidemic has shown that uh, health being state subject doesn't make sense at all. Uh, it should be a concurrent subject. Also for digital health, if we are trying to make the uh, data more interoperable and uh, having uh, seen this issue of migrant workers which uh, uh, go from each state to other state and uh, their health uh, issues, then uh, making uh, uh, health as a concurrent subject, I think is a must. Thank you. Sorry, I went slightly over my time. Thank you, Dr. Bhushan. I think those were very succinct remarks, a lot to pack into five minutes. And I think it just reminded me of the statement that India is a continent that disguised itself as a country. 
uh, and I think uh, that is a that's a good segue to uh, Dr. Krishnan because it means that uh, as uh, we certainly have both a healthcare crisis on our hands, but also an economic crisis, and we need to think of how the two interface with each other. So I turn to you for your opening remarks on how you see uh, the Indian economy doing and how that's the various interconnections with health. Thank you, Argya. Uh, at the very beginning, let me <coughs> express my happiness at being at this event. I probably have attended all your annual events and I'm happy. I've been a continuing sort of part of the Vidhi journey. Uh, I have an association uh, professionally with you, which I'm very proud of. Uh, excellence as well as professional integrity of your work. I continue to see it in my current capacity in the cross-border insolvency work. I want to compliment you and your team and all of the people behind the work because it's something we don't get to acknowledge. Uh, so keep up the good work uh, and uh, looking forward to more such uh, work from you. With that background, on kickstarting the economy, there are essentially five uh, notes in the uh, briefing book. I will confine myself uh, to perhaps two of them. If there is some, I'd like to touch upon all of them. More important, uh, based on the two of them, I also want to make four general points. Let me start with the first one. A crisis management agency for the financial sector and uh, a good very uh, neat cases made out in the one and a half pages on the need for such a statutory agency. Now, many of us may not have known, I'm sure some of us would have known, all we do is go to chapter nine of the financial sector legislative reforms committee, Krishna, uh, much more famous now for his data privacy uh, report. And what does he recommend? He recommends, the report recommends in chapter nine, uh, an agency which will have five elements. And the four elements that are uh, of relevance to the sort of the fifth element, I will skip for want of time. The fifth element explicitly mentioned in the report and legislated upon in the form of a draft legislation is crisis management. And it explains why items A to D are essential for item E, which is crisis management. In other words, a statutorily created financial stability development council and, and your report and your note acknowledges very briefly, uh, given the constraint of space, this point. So an excellent draft legislation exists to create a statutory crisis management agency in India. Point well taken, we need on that. Uh, the other point I want to again briefly touch, uh, given that we have little time, is the deeper government bonds mark related suggestion. In your briefing book, it's called the Bharat Nirman, Nav Nirman bonds. If you go through the elements of what you've recommended, for instance, perpetual bonds, with only interest as an option, uh, trouble in the markets, much greater participation of people. Exactly these are what constitute chapter 12 of the same report, the Financial Sector Legislative Reforms Commission report. Uh, page 117 of the report, table 12.5, has a set of reforms, which is exactly what you have summarized in Bharat Nav Nirman bonds. So the short point is, like in many sectors, India has looked at these problems. Very often, India has also looked at these solutions. We need to act on solutions that we have debated and we've agreed upon. The other three points on MSME financing, uh, insolvency of MSMEs, uh, leverage digital banking, etc. For want of time, I'll skip at this stage. If you have uh, one more minute for me, I just want to make four general points. Point one, we need to keep in mind that, that India has a long history of quote unquote, legislating away problems. 
we think legislation is the end of problems very often it's the beginning of finding solutions to problems and what is that beginning point to build state capacity it is relatively easy to legislate we often don't even get that right getting legislation right is the beginning we need to build state capacity to be able to implement the legislation three and you emphasize this correctly you emphasized it in your introductory remark you said in the briefing book we need to reform rebuild or refashion broken institutions this is critical fourth get the state versus market balance right and i this is another theme which should run across various sectors indu alluded to it there is a case for much larger public health funding from government there is an equal case for private players but well regulated private players so i think getting the state market balance right particularly in the economy is very important i'll stop here one second short of 5 minutes thank you thanks very much dr krishnan i think that sets the stage beautifully because of the because we've got now a range of perspectives both on what we need to do on healthcare and what we need to do as far as the economy is concerned and one common thread that seems to be emerging is state capacity uh, i think in doing all this we must not forget that at the end of the day who are we doing it for and we are doing it for the people particularly the most vulnerable Uh, so i'm just going to turn to some comments that rohini nilekani had i just spoke to her a little earlier today about what reforms we need particularly from the point of view of protecting the vulnerable so i'm just going to share my screen so that we can see what rohini has to say namaste everyone and thanks so much to vidhi for organizing this very important discussion about what the post covid world looks like in terms of governance and laws um i have been asked to speak about the area of protecting the vulnerable and vidhi in this booklet has come up with five areas about protecting the vulnerable one of them is about protecting wildlife and as you can see i am coming to you from the beautiful wildlife of india in the southern forest of kabini where uh, many people come to see probably the world's most famous black panther today when we say vulnerable we can start about thinking about vulnerable ecosystems and it's very important to understand that vulnerable ecosystems create vulnerable human populations as well so the more we do to protect these vulnerable ecosystems the more likely we are to protect ourselves and the most vulnerable among us we already know through the pandemic the deep interconnection between the way we treat wildlife and the, our own public health so zoonotic diseases all of those things are intricately inter, inter, intertwined with the way we treat wildlife and so this has been a huge wake up call for all of us in terms of laws in terms of new ways at looking at india's tremendous natural biodiversity and how we move to protect it better vidhi has come up with some suggestions i would like to make two points on that yes definitely we need better governance structures and better legislation we have to be extremely careful that in the name of economic development we do not destroy the very base on which our economy is built which is the ecological base of our natural ecosystems our laws currently are moving too rapidly in the name of restoring economic growth to pull back environmental laws i think that would not be the smartest way for us to protect the most vulnerable and in fact to protect the whole population of this country i think we need better laws i think we need better governance structures but one important thing to keep in mind as vidhi tries to uh, magnify the impact of this uh, booklet that they have put together is you cannot really in a place like india separate the people from the ecosystem the minute you try to do that we've had many many disasters in this country always working with the people the forest dwellers the tribals those who care most deeply and understand the forest most deeply we must 
co-create the new governance systems together with them. We cannot leave them out, certainly not in India, if we want to succeed in protecting the vulnerable and protecting our vulnerable ecosystems. As far as the other issues that Didi has brought up, which is the issues of labor, of protecting migrants, of protecting gig economy workers, these are all the new vulnerable. And we really have to strengthen our labor laws, the way we manage human beings in distress, whether it is when they've just got unemployed, when, a, when it is when they're trying to migrate back to their own homes, when they have become uh, unwitting partners of a new economy, such as the gig economy, where the promise was huge that they would be independent entrepreneurs. But as it turned out, the system was quite stacked against them. This is where we need creative, humane, and implementable new laws and governance structures so that when we protect those workers, we are protecting all of society. The last thing that uh, Vidhi brought up in this section on protecting the vulnerable was about domestic violence. And that during the pandemic, we have seen rising cases of domestic violence with very frustrated people locked into small spaces, very afraid, very uncertain about the future. I think while the idea of protection officers, etc., is good, it really has to be done very carefully so that we are not putting arbitrary power in the hands of the wrong people. These are societal issues. The law and the governance structures cannot go too far ahead of them. So when it comes to intensely um, intimate issues like domestic violence, I think decentralizing the response to the lowest possible unit using the principle of subsidiarity, I think that's what makes sense. And my last point in this introductory speech is about digital inclusion. Right now, the future is digital. There is no escaping it, and it has been intensified in the last four months. Education especially is particularly amenable to digitizing it for the sake of all those who have been left out. I think we need new packages from the government to make sure that every single child and every single family has access to digital devices and internet connectivity. Magic can happen when a lot of people put their minds together to decide to reach the last child, the last child with disabilities, and we have millions and millions of those. This is the time when we rethink, when we give up technophobia, and we start designing technology for inclusion. At XTEP for the last several years, we have been trying our best to do just that. And I think this is the moment to seize, to once and for all create proper digital inclusion. I'll give you the rest of my thoughts later. Thank you so much for including me in this program. Thank you, Alga. Thank you, Vidhi. Uh, so those were, those were Rohini's thoughts, and I think it segues neatly into uh, Lalitesh, because one of the key things that we've, uh, we've heard throughout the three speakers is the role of technology, whether it be for protecting the vulnerable, where it's not perhaps being seen as inclusive, in digital health, where we haven't really made much of a beginning, and of course the economy, where tech is supposed to be some kind of magic bullet. So what is your uh, vision of, a, of technology in governance in post-COVID India. Thanks, Argyo, and uh, congratulations to Vidhi on its uh, anniversary and continued success. Um, I think te technology is a new um, power. It's a new weapon, if you will, uh, which can be used for whatever purposes. It's a source of energy which can be used for whatever purposes we want. And uh, if you look at you know, technology purely from a physics point of view, what we are talking about digital technology where we are replacing atoms with bits, atoms with electrons. So if you look at the ratio of uh, an atom or a proton to an electron, it's a 1900 to one mass. And that's the kind of ratio you get when uh, you are actually trying to translate um, any, any, system or, any system or process that is translatable to digital will have that kind of a upside. It will initially start with a 10 to 100 factor and then eventually you know, gravitate towards a thousand fold uh, improvement with the same cost, right? Um, and uh, Dr. Indubushan, who spoke first, health is probably one of the 
areas which is most ripe for disruption because health at the end of the day is an information problem right it's it's a sensing an information problem uh, to provide care to people um but i think the focus is not on technology i think the focus is on impact what value we can provide to society and uh, increasingly i am seeing the barriers the, the barrier is not technology which has become cheaper and india certainly has the capacity to build almost any technology we choose to build um and i think the barrier is policy itself because technology enables paradigm shifts and it enables rapid paradigm shifts and those who embrace the paradigm shifts win and lead the game of technology and uh, and those who are unable to do it or do it much more slower lag behind and they become you know colonized in the long run uh, the technology tends to colonize them um and uh, and the very same uh, um systems that we have in place will be hard pressed to embrace those paradigms so let me give a couple of examples um we are witnessing have been witnessing one of the largest migrations in human history and we saw a negative impact of that during this covid crisis and uh, um and one of the Im negative impacts was because these people don't have addresses they are not counted they are not in the voter rolls um both from a logistics point of view and a attention point of view um in a resource constrained environment obviously any local government is going to focus on once they can identify and once who are on their voter rolls right so you have these immigrants for years living in another state who really don't have an umbrella over them right now the question is why can't we you know create uh, the ability for them to vote from anywhere um and uh, if i take the argument of democracy further i'm going to provoke a little bit uh if the, if we take the argument of a democracy fur further um are there areas where we need not be a republic and be a true democracy where people vote on what they really want right um for a small country it has been possible like switzerland but for a large country it's never been possible until now it is now possible now the question is should we embrace it and will we be allowed to embrace it um and another example i'd like to give is uh, the land rights issue um and every uh, since i discovered this issue uh, every economist i have spoken to says that yes dematerializing or providing solid uh, land rights will have an enormous impact on uh, um the economic upside of india we don't we don't have to look very far one of our allies the us has uh, successfully done that um and uh, even though they are a 20 trillion dollar economy about 15 to 20 trillion dollars of capital that sloshes around in that economy is from land um uh, which is 40% of their land is uh, uh, is been mortgaged and serves as a capital base especially in a crisis it serves as a cushion from which you know the nation can spring back again and we don't have that less than 3 or 4% of our land has been mortgaged um and i'll give a simple example of where that hits really hard um you know most farmers in india have you know two or two and a half acres like one hectare or something 0.8 hectares of land and uh, the value of that land is somewhere in the range of in, depending on where you live 15 to 20 lakhs 10% of that is 1.5 lakhs at the lower end and every you know financial institution in india struggles to provide them that 1.5 lakh rupees loan and and research upon research in the agri area and so on shows that if they had that 1.5 to 2 lakhs rupees per acre or and they were able to deploy that um effectively and there are mechanisms by which we have to figure out how to deploy effectively they will pull themselves out of poverty permanently right and this has never become possible and uh, now now let's take the other extreme one of the largest land holders in india is the indian railways right and the indian railways is capital starved it needs about i think last i heard a report somewhere that they need about Two and a half to two, three trillion dollars of capital to really modernize and become as efficient and as fast as you know um, France or Japan or one of these countries. Um, and we do have the ability to innovate and build that innovation. But the question is, where is that money going to come from? Indian Railways is actually sitting on about a trillion dollars of land, which they cannot monetize and they cannot mortgage. Right? So this is one example. Um, now the question is, you know, why am I talking about this? There is obviously a digital solution, which is dematerialization, blockchaining, and so on, which comes into play. 
but there is also a policy solution right um and a very senior uh, bureaucrats or mentors of mine and one or two very senior politicians in one of their weaker moments you know said that look you know we we know this needs to be done we would like to do it but the day we do it we will lose power we will be wiped out because the lord of the you know land is the basis of power of the local you know strong men and without them we will lose power right now how do we get to solutions of you know tough problems like this and you know let me just give one more example on health the example on health is you know should health be you know certification based the health provider should they be certification based or should they be cap capability based outcome based and measurement based right and unlocking that might actually dramatically increase our health capacity um and many of these are you know these holy cows um and one of the one of the you know um, one of the uh, tougher conclusions i'm reaching reaching is that there may be no other solution than to use this very technology we are talking about and maybe create uh, a grassroots effort um a second independence movement if you will to kind of free ourselves of many of the shackles which become once place become very hard to un you know undo thanks alidesh i think there are some very provocative thoughts in there and uh, with a very provocative ending that perhaps it's time to take the power back to the people but what i liked about what you said was the fact that perhaps the technology solutions are there but the political economy which will drive those technological solutions are not there so let me take that uh, to dr bhushan uh, dr bhushan you had mentioned in digital health that dig in digital health we haven't done enough in this country uh so given the fact that lalitesh says that you know indians can innovate at, at any point of time what in your view is necessary that we need to do so that digital health can truly be something that is both accessible and inclusive dr bhushan i seem to have lost him for a moment okay uh, i think you, can you see me yes so yes. digital health is a very broad concept it uh, goes from electronic medical records to say telemedicine uh, use of ai for uh, reading of uh, uh, reading of uh, say x ray plates to uh, use of data but uh, so what strikes me is that uh, uh, given that we are so good in it and we are supposed to be or we are it superpower the level of use in of it in health is very little like it's like we are in like any other country if you go beyond say some of these corporate hospitals i think use of uh, uh, it is uh, minimal so uh, through this uh, now uh, government has started the national digital health mission and uh, you are very kindly helping us with the, some of the policies that would uh, surround it so the idea would be to give everyone at least the option of creating Uh, id and uh, that id will help in terms of uh, tracking their uh, health record from birth to death but at the same time getting the all the hospitals and doctors also in the ecosystem providing each health uh, doctor doctor and health facility an id and uh, uh, encouraging hospitals to store and share information uh, digital uh, digitally uh, same with the a doctors uh, having the digital identity uh, able to e sign and provide e prescription and all three uh, major pillars of health uh, sector uh, doctors uh, facilities and patients uh, being linked through the this, uh, this platform and of course uh, others like uh, pharmacy through e pharmacy uh, um, being linked and facilities uh, include not only hospitals but also labs and uh, others so that uh, would provide first for hospitals and doctors uh, some sense of a uh, uh, be better sense of what has happened to the patient mm -hmm. right now when patient is uh, uh, treated most of the time doctors don't know what has happened before uh, and even if uh, there is some diagnostic test which is done probably they need to do it again because they don't have access to that and they don't know what kind of contradictory indication what kind of allergies the person has what kind of drugs don't suit the person so all that is not available and once uh, we have this long term record the quality of uh, healthcare will be uh, much better 
uh, and then at the same time uh, there'll be greater accountability because right now uh, doctors uh, prescribe something and there's no record of what they prescribe both in terms of diagnostics or in terms of uh, maybe over prescription of uh, antibiotics that will be caught at the same time government and researchers don't have that information uh, through which they can uh, see uh, what kind of things work and what kind of problems are coming um, uh, there. So linking this will be very important. And probably one good thing with the, uh, now is uh, I'm seeing the positive side. Since uh, we are starting afresh, we can cut across many of the problems that uh, developed countries have gone through and uh, have that uh, the problem in developed country has been of the interoperability where data from uh, one hospital to other hospitals, it's almost impossible to take. Here we can design a system which will be interoperable. That's right. No, and I think that's great. And I'll just take that to Lalitesh and to members of the audience. We are open for questions. So please do type in your questions and we'll try and take as many as possible. But Lalitesh, just taking on from what uh, Dr. Bhushan was saying, it seems that the the digital innovation still seem to be happening for the top 5% of the population and not for the remaining 95. This is exactly what Rohini was also saying that technology, it's fine to talk about technology, but technology is not inclusive. And especially given the fact that we now, what, in our country, about 40% of the country alone has uh, smartphone connectivity, uh, I mean, mobile phone connectivity. So we are really talking about a very small number of our population. So when we are talking about tech and particularly in health, if you could give examples from there, how can it be truly inclusive or are we only talking about the top 10%? So technology so far has been uh, actually not even the top 10%. So 80 million people constitute 90% of India's disposable income. Mm -hmm. And that is all of those people that technology serves. Technology doesn't even serve India's middle class, so-called middle class, uh, which is, I mean, if you want to really gauge what the middle class is, a family where there is an earning driver and an earning maid is constitutes middle class by our definition. Right? So, so, I mean, they are above poverty, but they are still not, you know, empowered and served fully. So I fully agree. Technology is not serving the mainstream yet, but there's a potential to. And, uh, you know, uh, in as much as we talk about private enterprise, this will not happen naturally unless we actually step in and create a public effort to do so. Um, and I'm talking about very, very basic infrastructure layers. So one of them is, of course, fiber everywhere. We need fiber to home and the per capita cost of providing fiber to home um, is about 17 to $20 per capita. And there is no intervention. There is no infrastructure intervention which has larger ROI than that. And I'm specifically talking about fiber to home because we are about a decade away from everybody having 5G in their hands, woman, child, and so on. And women and child are being left out right now because even in rural areas where 25, 35%, South India, there's about 50% of uh, the people have smartphones, families have smartphones, the smartphone is in the guy's hands. Most of the day, the woman and child don't have access to bandwidth, right? Mm -hmm. And without bandwidth, neither education happens, nor health can happen, nor many of the other interventions. All the things we are talking about empowerment begin with bandwidth, right? So I'm, I'm talking about basics. Right? Okay. Um, and, and I think that has to get solved and that has to be, I mean, it sounds mundane to talk about bandwidth in a high bro discussion, but I think it's like, you know, Vizli, Sadak and Pani. If you don't do that, everything else is hotter. That's right. So at the, at the end of the day, we are talking here about building an infrastructural layer or creating some public goods. And that public good can only be created by the state is what I'm taking away from it because the private sector will not be necessarily interested in serving the remaining, whatever, one billion of our population. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll just take that to Dr. Krishnan and I'll take one of the questions that came up. Dr. Krishnan, this links with your question of state capacity. You said that state capacity is underlying a lot of the reforms that we need to think about and we are not speaking of. So what are the ways in which we start thinking about building state capacity, particularly in healthcare, number one. Number two, a question from Professor Balbir Arora to you it has, is that we think when we think about economic management, we tend to think about some kind of centralization. And he says that we think, we, we feel that federalism is missing in this discussion, even when we are talking about economic management. How do you respond to that? Uh, let me respond to your first question, uh, which is on state capacity. I think the beginning of uh, serious discussions on state capacity should start with, you know, the very fact that you are an underdeveloped country implies that you have limited 
state capacity. Now, the causality uh, runs both ways, but clearly limited state capacity is a characteristic of an emerging country. Given that, we need to then strategically prioritize. And that's the reason for my state versus market. For instance, Lalitesh, Indu, you brought out, and, and uh, so did uh, Rohini, some clear tasks which are public good provision, which cannot be and will never be done efficiently or equitably by non-state market players. The state therefore needs to, I think, clearly focus on what is a public good. And there are standard paradigms which tell you what the state should be working on and what the state should not be doing. To illustrate, Lalitesh Ji spoke about land. Now in land, our focus has been entirely on trying to solve a very difficult problem of land acquisition, including for private sector projects. Whereas I think a lot of the focus ought to be on doing, for instance, what he said, get quality land records, ensure that a market develops so that the next Infosys or Wipro doesn't need to come to government for land acquisition, but can do a fair deal in the market. So on state capacity, my suggestion would be strategically choose areas where the state needs to be effective and be present and build capacities in those. And it's not as if we've not done this before. Pre-independent India used to do land administration reasonably well. We had the best technology of those times, so I think it's doable. Even current India, for instance, does elections extremely well. This is something which has been documented well. It does Kumbh Mela very well. So it does episodic tasks very well. Can we do sustained state capacity building? That's part one. Part two, I'm glad uh, Professor Aroda brought up that question. I am a little uncomfortable. For instance, in those sweeping suggestion that health should become a concurrent list subject is something I am deeply worried about. Technology, by definition, is centralizing. But a lot of India's problems need decentralized solutions. So I think we need to figure out aspect of health or public health is local, what aspect is regional, what aspect is national. Now, during this COVID pandemic, we found out some of the state government responses have been absolutely stupendous. Isolate what needs to be done locally because there are clear theoretical frameworks on which you decide spatially the incidence of a particular public policy benefit, decide what is local, what is regional, what is national. I think there is a good case in the light of technology, in the light of various other developments to re revisit this topic periodically. Clearly, we've discovered during this public health pandemic that a lot of public health related response of movement, etc., need to be national. The migrant movement problem cannot be solved by a state. That has to be solved nationally. But some other problem, isolation uh, of contact tracing, needs to be probably done by the panchayat, by the local body. And this very clear identification, I'm on economics, I'm sure there is a political layer, there is a sociological layer. I think we need to be clear on government and then revisit this issue. I'm glad, Professor, uh, the gentleman that you mentioned, brought it up. Uh, I'll stop here. Thanks. No, thanks. So I think I'll take that to Dr. Bhushan actually, because it's coming back to the point that you made right at the beginning, that the state in India does not spend enough on public health, nowhere near enough on public health. What Lalitesh said, the state in India, and this is not against any political party, as in anything it cuts across, uh, does not care about migrants because migrants are not part of the voting population. 
then the state is not interested in doing infrastructure level work in land but is interested in a solution such as land acquisition and this is something we've seen both governments the upa and the nda focus their energies on what is it given that you're so called inside the governmental machinery now what is it that is in the thinking of governments and the issues that they take up and the ones that they don't and what is it that will move governments towards taking up issues such as health migrants and other vulnerabilities okay so earlier i had said that uh, we are not doing many of the things uh, that we should be doing but uh, let me start with some positive story and uh, i'm not saying that because uh, i am working on this scheme uh, but uh, as, uh, and it actually covers both digital and uh, vulnerable and health uh, is uh, the scheme ayushman bharat pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana and if you look at the it platform which has been created uh, for this uh, scheme pm jay uh, it's uh, around the world i think one of the best and most robust because it links about 50 crore people with uh, more than 22000 hospitals and uh, all these states uh, and most of the states have different schemes actually they have a lot of other nuances and uh, so right now a poor person uh, may not be uh, educated can get a uh, service end to end uh, through a uh, it it platform uh, without uh, uh, showing any paper once uh, the person has been identified and without any money and we have the record of the person from the day the person was admitted into the hospital and uh, leaves the hospital and after the hospital also uh, feedback is received from him or her uh, to uh, about this, uh, the kind of service it received and it's cashless and uh, this kind of system uh, we were having a meeting yesterday with the indonesian counterparts and they've been running a scheme for last 15 years uh, they are still working on the paper based system and uh, also in developed countries this kind of system is not there and even in the government uh, we have uh, all these schemes, CGHS and others. Uh, most of them are paper-based and you have to spend money and then have the papers, uh, uh, file papers and uh, get the reimbursement done. And many of them are now coming on this platform. So it is possible and to leapfrog to IT and link all these, um, uh, uh, link uh, the left out and the vulnerable and the uh, people uh, in the poorest uh, uh, ranks and provide them benefits uh, using the using technology and <coughs> so that's a thing that the government has done and uh, it shows uh, how it can help in terms of uh, delivery of uh, uh, social sector programs and uh, the now the new this national digital health mission uh, also would take this uh, agenda forward in terms of improving the quality of services improving accountability uh, but again uh, going back to arguing with the kp uh, on the issue of concrete subject uh, here we had a meeting with the states and some of the states were saying that why should we be implementing national digital health mission and also why are you talking about this uh, health information exchange at the national level it should be state level because it's a state subject why should we share any data uh, with the national level Again, uh, I think uh, since the uh, government of India provides uh, ab about uh, one third of the money for the health sector and all these uh, uh, issues that we've seen uh, coming out of COVID, uh, I'm not saying that it should be a national, a federal subject, but it should be a concurrent subject where uh, both national and uh, state priorities uh, sh should, uh, sh should match. Okay, so I think uh, before I, Dr. Krishnan responds to that. Okay, do you want to do that right away? Yeah, sure. Let's have that debate on just a the state. Quick, quick, current. quick. One minute point. Yeah. Uh, this is precisely the wrong reason for government of India's intervention. By constitution, government of India has largest purse. By the constitution is very clear. Government of India collects and distributes this money. And because government of India spends the largest amount on health, for that reason, it should not become a concurrent subject. I think that's the wrong reason. The reason should be a particular good or service is a national public good. 
because government of india is funding the subject does not become national in character i think we need to get this bit of the constitution correct well, i think that's interesting because actually uh, i was just reading the constituent assembly debates where h v kamath the member who argued as dr bhushan is arguing that it should be in the concurrent list suggests it's because of the fact that health has been the cinderella of all portfolios he said that it's been abjectly neglected during the british time and it should be the top priority to create a national public good and i think those are good reasons for thinking about health in the concurrent list so question for lalitesh uh, uh, and i think there are a couple that comes out of uh, what our audience members have been asking rajiv rajan has asked that some persons with disabilities who have high restrictions in participation are not able to access most of the technology and how do you think technology in design can be made more accessible to this group of population that's one and second to any of the panelists uh, paritosh tyagi asks legislation envisages control over conduct and not attitude our problems he says are largely related to attitudes particularly towards law is it possible that legislation can reform attitude lalitesh please go first okay um so i think that's a very uh, you know clever question the reason i'm saying it's clever is um you know the brutally ruthless people who uh, look at that question will say you are now talking about less than 0.1% of the country depending on how you define differently able right but the reason why it's important is we actually focus and figure out a system which serves you know the least able um from a technology point of view not least able from you know their individual capacity uh, from a sight and sound and the things that are required to access and use technology um you then actually make it possible for everybody to access technology um including the vast majority who are quasi literate and a lot of people who are illiterate and so on um and one way to do that is to bring this jugalbandi between you know public and private right so you know when the government creates a public good um if that public good and uh, you know uh, dr indubushan is in the process of doing something like this um when the national mission uh, health mission comes to life uh, we are not going to have um a single monolith which will serve every language which will serve you know every dialect and which will serve people who you know are color blind there are different kinds of color blind right it's not it's not possible for one it team to do all of that it's not going to happen what will happen is this approach of apis um where we are where we give power away where we say that look you know we are going to minimize what the government does and take the minimum of what the government is going to do and and codify that as a set of apis the language the lingua franca of you know what will be spoken via technology and the and how the information will be shared and you know interchanged and transacted and then leave the you know uh, delivery of that the usage of that even the workflows built around that to the people so the innovation can happen and also inclusion can happen see inclusion happens with the government trusting the public that the private enterprise will you know um, rise to the occasion and uh, a level of a level playing field which will allow you know a university uh, team to a startup to a large enterprise to play in that and then uh, initially of course everybody will rush towards the uh, you know the 80 million users we are talking about but over time that uh, that shock wave spreads out and it will reach everyone um and uh, and that has successfully been done any time we have released you know open apis so it's one of those things i think uh, can be deeply empowering if you think so sure, dr krishna you like to take that on legislation and attitudes because this is a commonly held sentiment that you know the law can change some things but it can't change the way in which individuals fundamentally think yeah uh, at one level yes uh, equally another level no uh, very often attitudes are also shaped by the law and it's not just the letter of law but the enforcement of the law i don't jump uh, traffic signals when i am driving in the united states and i do it routinely in delhi so i haven't changed i am the same human my attitude in the us is different from my attitude in lodi road primarily because i know that the probability of law enforcement in the us if caught is 100% and it's please zero or near zero in lodi road so 
it is not entirely correct to say uh, you know um, attitude alone that matter i think attitudes get shaped by law and how the laws are enforced so i guess it goes back to our earlier question laws are not the only solution very often laws are an important part of the solution but india typically has passed laws and concluded that we have solved the problem whereas very often it's the beginning of the solution so i think i'll continue to work on this front fair enough so we take i I'll, I'll come back to this on this uh, from public health perspective i think i wanted to give the example of this uh, what uh, kp gave but in smoking for example what has happened is that uh, over time uh, i think attitudes also have changed uh, earlier uh, i remember when i was uh, uh, still in the government uh, government had issued this notice uh, or circular that uh, you should uh, put a board in your uh, room that smoking is not from a, uh, smoking is not allowed and uh, in the secretariat i went to my batchmate's room and he was smoking away he said, i said but you put a huge uh, huge board that uh, smoking is not allowed he said you know a circular has come which says that you to, I have to put a board it doesn't say that i can't smoke and uh, he was still smoking but now if you go around in any of the secretariats or any offices i think you will not see people smoking and that has happened all over the world in terms of uh, uh, this uh, change in uh, uh, attitude towards smoking so i think uh, if you uh, tell people uh, like uh, if you uh, tell uh, people about why they should not do something and there is a accept- acceptance it will happen it's happened for recycling it has happened for single use plastic now more and more uh, change in attitude so some of these uh, things work if you can touch the cord and uh, convince them but some things which probably people don't see why this is being done i think uh, uh, it uh, doesn't happen yeah i think attitudinal change takes time and and laws can be a major push in that direction i think anyone who knows the history of the hindu code bill as in will will know that everything takes time and changes are not overnight we have time for two last questions i'm going to combine these two and we'll then we are going to finish uh so there's a there's a question around predictive and faceless governance which i'm going to combine with a question around uh, arogya setu that has been asked particularly i don't want to limit it to arogya setu but particularly in terms of the fact that there are people when we think about new age tech solutions in a post covid india and we think about predictive and faceless governance how do we account for the marginalized who don't have access to technology who may be denied uh services or benefits that they were receiving beforehand and i think this is a constant criticism that you get to hear about exclusion and rohini had warned us of that prospect right at the beginning so how do we ensure that lalitesh to you that we don't forget the most vulnerable number one what is the way in which we think about it and the last question i think dr krishnan and dr bhushan you can take that should there be a national cadre of medical doctors in the country like the ips and the irs validation please um so see inclusion comes from uh, providing priority right if you take upi uh, as an example uh, which is a classic example of a you know huge global success um where we have rapidly become the fourth or third uh, largest payment system but most people in india still don't use upi um and it is uh, actually i mean people are going to say it's not by design i'm going to say it is by accidental design um and it is by accidental design i will not go into the technical reasons why there are technical reason why you know for example in rural india so you don't have debit cards debit cards are required and so on and so forth and then when you ask people in the if you ask going bankers saying hey man you are supposed to provide a debit card along with the savings account why on earth are you not providing a debit card i mean like why are you mistreating these people um and you harangue them enough and the truth comes out they're like man you know when i go to a village and i issue like 100 debit cards they don't remember the pin numbers so everybody has the same pin number 1111 and then they lose money and then they come back and bother right so it's it's a and see the, the problem is how you are building technology if you build technology where you do not take every person into account this is bound to happen right so when we built upi we did not take into account the fact that you know pin numbers are forgotten and because people don't remember pin numbers when they are not highly literate 
and they will forget them and as a result they will not have debit cards as a result upi will not be available so this you know um, this level of and and if nobody will get this right te technology right on day one so the solution now the question is what is the solution the solution is to be ruthless and transparent in outcome measurement right we have to have outcome measurement and it has to be you know outcomes that are desired not what outcomes we can deliver and we have to have the ruthlessness to measure it and make it real time and public so that the world can see, the people can see whether this technology that is built for them is actually useful for them. Sure. And, and, and if, if you actually get, I mean, and there is no doubt in my mind, we have, so, we have such clever people both in private and public part of India that if you actually give them a goal, we are very good at getting 100 out of 100. But we have to define that uh, barrier, uh, that parameters and make them public. Sure. Dr. Krishnan, would you like to take that question about a carder? Yeah, it's actually, uh, uh, I think we need to be clear. The Indian police service is an all India service, whereas the Indian revenue service is a central service. In other words, the latter, the revenue service is entirely controlled by government of India on subjects on which it has complete control, namely list one in the constitution seventh schedule. On the other hand, all India services have a very peculiar design recruited federally through the Public Service Commission, but operational control with states available to the Union of India. And that's because of the peculiar nature of the subject. I think a case needs to be made out if there is one for a similar carder in medicine. I don't prime of AC believe it exists. I don't know the domain very well, but purely from a constitutional or a civil service angle, both of which I know a little bit, I don't think there is a case for a national slash all India service for medical services. Right, fair. So I think we are almost out of time. I'm just going to give Rohini the last word because she had something to say about decentralization, particularly uh, because she comes to us from the forests of Kabini. Uh, so I'm just going to share her video with you and we will end there after. Yes. Alko, you have been asking about decentralization. I believe that these last four months have especially taught us the importance of decentralized governance. Because if you're thinking of inclusion, diversity matters. If you're thinking of diversity, context matters. And to be able to solve problems in context you need to be able to decentralize power structures because those who can listen closest to where the problem is. If you can redistribute agency to people to really be able to be part of the solution and not remain part of the problems, you have to give them the opportunities to solve their own problems. Whether it is issues of health, whether it is issues of education, whether it is issues of protecting the ecosystems around them, they have to be part of it. It cannot, when it comes down as a diktat from above, when it comes down as a uniform sort of ruling from above, you can see resistance from below. And that's why when we are designing uh, what we call societal platforms to have impact at scale, we always say we need unified structures in this country which is where the union government comes in, which is where the state level authorities come in, because you do need to create unified frameworks, but you have to make sure that there is, they are not uniform structures, that they allow for context, they allow for diversity, they allow for a flexible and resilient response. So I think, uh, I think that's a good note to end with, that we need a unified structure, because at the end of the day, we are a country but it needn't be a uniform structure. And at the end of the day, if we want uh, governance reforms in post-COVID India, I think one thing Rohit I can take away from what all the panelists have said today is that we need governments who listen and who are incentivized to listen. So with that, we'll stop. I'm sorry, we can't take all the questions, but we've tried to take as many as we can. Uh, thank you very much to our panelists, Dr. Bhushan, Dr. Krishnan, Lalitesh, and Rohini for joining me today. And thank you to all the attendees who came in large numbers. Uh, we have a series of conversations lined up to follow our social media handles or the print social media handles to get uh, information on those. Thank you very much for joining us. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.